So before we talk too much about what makes a website search friendly, we first have to understand what the components of a search engine are. Now, one of these we've already talked about, which is that search engine results page, and that's really the only component that is user facing. In other words, that a user will see when they go to a website and log in. But there are two other main components, right? One is a spider, uh, which essentially is a little uh, bot that crawls the web, a piece of software that crawls the web collecting web pages, right? And of course it gets its name from the World Wide Web and it's crawling the World Wide Web and so it's a spider, right? Um, and then the other thing is the database. So the spider finds a new website, grabs a copy or grabs some of the uh, summary information about the website at least, usually grabs a copy, uh, and then stores it in the database, right? Um, and the database is unique. It's not a general database. It's a database where the pages are actually indexed by appropriate keyword phrases uh, that, that people might type in to find that page, right? And of course, you have that search engine results page, which is basically a display of those results, pull from the database when uh, presented and presented to a searcher or user of the website. So when we talk about making a website friendly, what we're really talking about search friendly is really talking about making it spider friendly, right? Making sure that the content is uh, put up in such a way that the spiders can actually harvest the content. So what that means is you don't want to put a lot of content into what they call the dark web, which is the areas of the web that the spiders can't harvest. So this is behind password protected websites, for instance, uh, form generated content. So if you have to type in a bunch of stuff in order to generate the actual uh, piece of web content, then that's hard for them to grab. Uh, content that's embedded in images and tables, though actually search engines are getting better at that every day to the point where in the near future that may no longer be an issue. Uh, and you should make sure that as much of your content is as available as can be, right? And the more you have available, the better you are able to compete against uh, your competitors. Now, in some cases, of course, there's some content that you might want to put on your web that you don't want um, everyone to be able to access or be able to find, right? So maybe you're doing um, a private release of certain content, uh, certain thought pieces or something for certain individuals. You can actually use what's called the robots.txt file uh, to specify to any search engine which content they can and cannot collect. Um, and you know, just for a brief second, let me show you what that looks like. So I'm gonna pause the recording. Okay, so here I've brought up uh, ESPN.com's robots.txt file. By the way, robots.txt, because of the way it's set up, um, because anyone has to be able to read it, it's readable to everyone, right? Uh, and what I mean by that is that you can go to any website and if they have a robots.txt file, you can just type in the website's name plus robots.txt and it'll bring it up, right? So as you can see for ESPN, they're disallowing uh, the search engine from the admin stuff, uh, from some of the flash areas, which I can't grab anyways, from the ESPN radio podcast, right? Um, and different other places. A lot of times this is either content that it doesn't want them indexing because of the fact that it's large media content or something like that. Or it might be content that's private, you know, the, like the admin content prop is potentially private, right? And so um, as a result of that, they're able, you're able to control that through this simple robots.txt file that has a very simple format. The point of this class is not to teach you exactly how to fill one of those out, but to let you know that it exists and it allows you to control your search engine optimization a little bit better. Okay. Um, let's go back to the talk. Okay, so now you've made your website spider friendly, you've added a robots.txt file you need to do, what's the next step? Well, the next step is now that you know that your content can actually be grabbed by a search engine, let's identify some key phrases that will help the second part of the search engine, the database, index your work appropriately so that when a user types in a certain keyword phrase, they find your content, right? Um, and so, you know, a lot of times what we mean by key phrases or keyword phrases are things that you would want someone who is searching for something that you want the answer to be, or that you want yourself to be the answer to, what phrases would they type in? So for instance, if I want someone to find my company, what things do you think that they might be searching for? So if you go down that path, that's the right path to think about when developing your list of keyword phrases. You can also use a bunch of tools out there and you can actually ask your customers, right? Um, search engines, in a way, are attempting to pair up the best page with the searcher who typed in a key phrase. Um, and so what you wanna do is figure out what are those phrases that those the, the, the best users for you are likely to type in, right? 
Search engines almost always take related terms, misspellings, and synonyms into account, right? So you don't need to worry about getting the exact wording of that phrase correct. You want to get the core idea that's going to easily translate correct instead. You should think about what someone is searching for your website and might type into Google. How are they actually going to go through that process? And to do that, you can use tools like Google's Keyword Planner to help you out. What you really want when you think about it is something I call a maximal return key phrase, right? You won't necessarily, you don't necessarily want every phrase related to your website content to be what your website is optimized for. What you really want is a phrase that has A, the least competition, right? So people aren't optimizing for that same key phrase. So what makes your company unique or different? B, a high search value, right? More people are searching for it. C, a high propensity to convert, right? People who are likely to search this phrase are also likely to buy. And finally, a high value for conversion. People who search this phrase and buy are likely to buy a lot, right? So you can almost think of it as the value of the search divided by the competition uh, it tells you how many searches you're going to get, right, roughly, times the conversion rate tells you how many um, how many conversions you're likely to get as a result of optimizing for that key phrase times the value tells you how much money per conversion or how much overall value you're going to get from that particular optimizing for that key phrase let me give you an example as to how you might get some numbers for this i'm not going you know this is not an exact calculation there aren't like specific numbers you put in there uh, but i'll bring up the google keyword planner and we can take a look at it there Okay, so here we are in the Google Keyword Planner, and this is part of the Google AdWords program, and so you have to sign up for AdWords in order to get access to that, um, but uh, it's fairly easy to get up and running uh, once you do get that in, right? And so you can go in, and you can essentially type in a, a phrase that you want to optimize for, right? Uh, and this says, you know, on average, people are searching for the phrase digital marketing about 10,000 to 100,000 times per month. And then it'll give you some ideas about words to optimize for, right? And so you have this number of searches, but then it also tells you what the competition is. And this is actually in the case of bidding on ads, necessarily not in the case of natural search engine optimization, but still they're good proxies for each other, right? So you could try and identify phrases that you know might have a high number of searches, but a low competition, they might be more intriguing. So, you know, for instance, in this particular case, the digital marketing strategy and marketing agency have about the same amount of searches, but um, have much lower competition than, say, a digital agency or something like that. Okay, so that's Keyword Planner. We'll hop back to the video and talk some more.